We're going to carry on with our, um, with our series in Jonah, because there is yet more for the Lord to bring forth from his word. Let's, let's see what God wants to say to us through this passage this morning. I'm quite excited about this. Jonah, um, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. For anybody else who learned to sing the books of the Bible when they were a kid, this is Jonah chapter 4, another time. Jonah chapter 4. But to, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Um, we can have a Bible reading up, please, thank you. Uh, he prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And that's where it ends. Bit of a cliffhanger, really, isn't it? Today we have three, uh, we have um, four vital things not to miss. Then we have three questions from God. And then we have two chances. We have a second chance. Four, three, two. We have our slides, please. Have you ever, have you ever missed something? You, you, you just missed it. It was all, it's like that, isn't it? You see, yeah. just missed it. So perhaps uh, you uh, ever been playing cricket uh, like me? I was appalling at cricket, but I had this amazing image of me hitting a six. You know, every, every time I was there at the crease, and uh, and and I'd swing the bat. And there'd be this crunching noise behind me, and I'd turn around and, and see the stumps in a, in a heap on the floor. There's few things that are, are more humiliating in life than thinking you've hit a, a six and realising that the stumps are no longer in, in, in the floor. Or perhaps you've missed a train. You got distracted. You know, missed a train? Yeah. Or, or, and tried to fit too many things in. Did you miss a meeting? Maybe the reminder went on your phone. Uh, but you'd put your phone on silent, or, or you silence the reminder because you have so many reminders that you just silence it automatically, and you miss the meeting. Or, or maybe you missed an opportunity to say something. You, you just you look back and you think, if only I'd said that. If only I'd, I missed it. Or, or perhaps something, someone said something, and later you realise there could have been an opportunity there. You missed it. Or maybe that's enough about my life. When I realise that I've missed it, it's almost impossible to describe that feeling. Um, it's like a, a jolt of electricity comes through me, and I find myself at the same time desperately wanting to not have missed it, uh, 
desperately wanting the situation to be okay in spite of the fact that I've missed it, and at the same time desperately wanting for it not to matter that I've missed it. And, and the, the sort of toxic combination of those things together is a horrible feeling, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, I find my, but, but there's some good things there. I find myself desperately wanting to change my pattern of life so that I don't feel like that again. You know, Jonah missed four vital things. But he's humbly shared with us those things, interestingly. We'll come on to that later. But what can we learn from what Jonah missed to make sure that we don't miss it? Four things to miss. Three questions gently posed by God. Two chances. Four things Jonah missed. Firstly, God's love and character. Jonah says, I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. There you go, that's about it really. Pain, it's just a bit of a pain, isn't it really? So that's what you like. Jonah missed it. He could say the words, he knew the scripture, but it meant nothing to him. He felt it only applied to the people of Israel. It was only for them to be victorious in battle. God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. For James and John, it was the Samaritans. Remember James and John, the sons of thunder, they get <coughs> nicknamed by Jesus after they suggest that they should call down fire. <coughs> that they should call down fire on Samaria for, for, for turning away from Jesus. They, they never felt like that about, about the Israelites when they um, reacted like that, did they? Interesting. For Artie Kendall, and Artie Kendall wrote the book Total Forgiveness. One of the most challenging reads ever. It's, uh, he, he maps Jonah's, uh, no, Jonah, sorry, Joseph's journey of forgiving his brothers and then explains in, in detail about 10 points that proves uh, the depth of Joseph's forgiveness. But for Artie Kendall and the inspiration for him to write that book, the people that he forgave every day chose to forgive and forgive again people at a church who'd done harm to his children. For Nelson Mandela's bodyguard that spoke uh, at one of my children's schools on a Thanksgiving or prize giving, he forgave the guy who waterboarded him in prison. Were you brought up to think that some people are to be despised? Our coming together as a Christian community is one of the strongest signs to the onlooking world that there is something in this. Our gathering together. I remember um, the story of uh, a friend of mine who who brought someone to church who was a secular atheist. And uh, and they were a a a sociology degree, a social worker. And they said... This is just really strange. These people just shouldn't be in the same building, let alone talking to one another. This is just really strange. And that was such a strong sign to him, our coming together. And the depth of the love of God and his character extends to all. To all. Even to those that we don't want to forgive even to those who we wouldn't feel uncomfortable to know that they'd ended up in the wrong place at the end of their lives. And you tell me, yes, but you don't know what they did to me, John. I don't know, no. You tell me, you don't know what they did to my children. You tell me, you don't know what they did to my wife, to my mother, to my father, to my friend. Why? I don't know. But God does. And judgment belongs with the Lord. And compassion and grace belongs with us. Because it's what we've been given through Jesus. And it's for us to offer to others. Father, forgive them. 
for they know not what they are doing. Did you hear the echo of that in the words that we read? Who do not know their right hand from their left. God says that of a nation who use their hands to exact abuse and wickedness and evil on other human beings. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, says Jesus. Forgiveness. For people who are in the act of torturing him to death in the most painful way imaginable. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The words fall off our lips and they're good. They need to fall off our lips. It's good to repeat that. Because Jesus says that unless we forgive those who sin against us, our own forgiveness is in question. Jesus says, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled with your neighbor. God is gracious and compassionate. He misses and misapplies the word of God about the consistency of the character of God. It's not about persuading God to promote Israel. It's about God's, in, in, in this historical situation and in, in, in any nation in any context, it's about God's grace and compassion, his patience, his mercy, and his love for all. Jonah missed God's love and character. Jonah missed God's salvation purpose. In uh, Mark 8, verse uh, 11, the Pharisees asked for a sign. Uh, it's not like Jesus hadn't done any signs already by then. He'd done loads. Um, but th- th- they, that wasn't their motivation. But maybe they were thinking, oh, okay, well, you know, show us a sign, we'll back you. Together we'll conquer the Romans and take over the world. Uh, perhaps the most... One of the most chilling verses in the Bible is where uh, the lost say to Jesus, did we not do miracles in your name and uh, cast out demons in your name? And Jesus turns to them and says, away from me, you evildoers. I do not know you. I did not know you. Some of the most chilling words in scripture. Because even the most successful prophet, perhaps in history, who turned 120,000 people who hated him and hated his race, hated his people, and who were a superpower. They, they, they were the most powerful nation in the world at that time. Didn't need, they didn't need God. They turned to God. He was the most successful evangelist prophet, perhaps, in history. He missed the heart of God. Even, even some of the most, um, or the wisest uh, people of their time, the Pharisees, knew the Bible's back to front. They missed the heart of God. They missed God's salvation purpose. It's about God reaching people to save them, to enable them to turn to him, so that they can know his love, his grace, so that they can be transformed, so that they can be filled with his Holy Spirit, can live lives to the full. That's what it's about. Prophecy is about repentance, not fireworks, not smugly sitting there while God smites your enemies. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever should turn to him may not perish but have everlasting life. And then Jonah's obviously, quite obviously, missed the joy, hasn't he, really? <laughs> He's missed the joy. He's missed the joy of seeing others saved. Uh, what a shame. <laughs> what a shame. His only focus is himself. He even manages to whinge about a plant dying. Really? He's so, so enwrapped in his own little world that a plant dies and gets sunburnt, so he has a go at God. Yep. He's just whinging, isn't he? It, it's so easy, isn't it, to get introspective, to miss what God's doing in the wider world, in our communities, uh, and uh, to rejoice in that. And then this, <clears throat> this, this phrase um, about, should I not have concern? Should I not um, 
you know, uh, be compassionate, this gracious and compassionate God, this word compassion. There's an adept in it that doesn't really do justice in the text in this word. Because uh, it's, it's th- this idea that God not only sees, knows, and is intellectually involved. God is, God is personally and almost vulnerably, if that were possible for a sovereign God, get affected by what he sees and the situation and the circumstances that are in front of him. It's like when Jesus is going to Jerusalem and he weeps. He weeps for the people. That's the depth of his heart and that's the depth of the Father's heart. That's the great compassion of God. Jonah missed the compassion of God. Or did he? Or did he? As I said, Joan lived to tell us the tale. Why did he tell us the tale, I wonder? I wonder. Well, God asked Jonah three questions in maybe helping Jonah to see. Maybe later, as Jonah reflects, looking back at his life. Maybe Jonah's learned something to be able to share with us. God said to him, is it right for you to be angry about what has not happened? Is it right for you, Jonah, to be angry? Who are you that you should be excused for everything that you've done that's wrong? Let's be honest. But for the grace of God, here go I. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant, Jonah? There's this plant that's died. How, um, and, and you're angry about that? The plant was nothing to do with him. Is it your responsibility? Is this what should be weighing you down? Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Or... Or perhaps, and, Jonah, I've given you this illustration. I've given you this illustration. I've shown you this picture. I've taught you through this thing. And I'm trying to teach you this thing. I'm trying to help you out here. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant, Jonah? Give it some thought. What is God showing you? What is God showing you? In circumstances, in life, in situations, in pictures, through his word, through your daily readings, what is God showing you? And should not God have concern for the lives and souls of 120,000 people and animals? Is God not the most wonderful God of love? Who wants all we read in 1 Timothy to turn to him? Wants, that's his desire, that all should turn to him. And you're never too old to be repurposed by God. We don't know when in his life Jonah saw this and wrote it down. It's never too late for your relationship with God to be restored. We can lay it all down before him. The good and the bad. Lord, thank you for the good. I'm sorry for the bad. Lord, I recognize that I need a second chance. Because this cliffhanger that we're left with at the end of the book of Jonah is a little bit like the prodigal son, isn't it? Well, it's the beginning of the book of Jonah, and this is Tim Keller's book that I was recommending to you the other week, The Prodigal Prophet. And he, he draws this, this, um, the, the, this parallel. Because like the beginning of the book of Jonah, is, it's a bit like the prodigal son running away. And then by the time we get to the end of the book of Jonah... Jonah's in the role of someone else, isn't he? Who's Jonah, in the, who's Jonah in the role of at the end? The elder brother. That's right. Jonah's in the role of the elder brother. For you, those of you who might not know the story, there's two brothers, and one of them said, Father, give me my inheritance. Um, I'm, I'm off. I'm going to go and do some party, and I've had enough of you, your house, and your rules. I'm done. See you later. Just give me my inheritance now. So he went off, partied, blew all his money, uh, and thought, oh dear, I suppose I have to get a job like other people do. 
now that all of my pretend friends and all of my money have gone. And then he ends up working in a pigsty, uh, which wasn't great for a Jewish person, uh, and um, feeding the pigs and longs to fill his tummy, we're told, in the story that Jesus tells, with the food that the pigs are eating, but he can't. And then he comes to his senses, I love that bit, and says, even the servants, my father's servants, do better than this. Maybe I'll go back. I'll say I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be your son, but receive me back as one of your servants. I'll work well for you. And at least let me earn my living. Let me earn my, my, uh, my food. And then he goes back. and the, the father, of course, has been waiting for him every day. Um, the father's been looking out the window and sees him in the distance. And, 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 and he leaps for joy. You can hardly believe his eyes. Uh, grabs a cloak, grabs some shoes, and starts legging it out towards his son. Uh, the, the, the son sees him coming, and he continues to rehearse his carefully prepared speech and delivers, and delivers it. I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Please accept me as a servant, and I will work hard for you. And the son says, put a robe on his shoulders, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, kill the fattened calf, the one that we save for the best celebrations. Kill the fattened calf, invite everybody over, we're having a party. Because this son of mine was lost and is now found He was dead, and now he is alive. That's the heart of the Father. That's the heart of God. And the elder brother hears about what's happened, and he's not impressed. And he goes to his father and says, Father, I've served you all of these years faithfully. I didn't go and squander your money on prostitutes, and on parties, on drugs, on raves. And here comes this younger brother. And you kill the fat calf for him? Do you hate me? Do you hate our inheritance, our family? Don't I deserve a fat calf? And the father says, I know you have been faithful to me. I love you. But this, your brother has come back. He has come back. He's saved. Come with me. Come with me. And let's rejoice together. We're given a second chance to join the party. We can seize that chance today. We can seize that chance today. Jesus said, the time is now. Repent and believe the good news. Paul said, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Oh Lord, help me never to become so familiar with your word that it fails to connect with my heart and with your heart. Oh Lord, thank you for your salvation purposes. Thank you for your desire to save the world. Lord, I I know about your holiness. I know about your desire for me to be holy. And that's so good and right and true. Never let that, I pray, become an obstacle within me that makes me fail to see your love for others. Open my heart with Jesus, I pray today. Open my heart, even to my enemies. God, thank you.
Thank you for what you've done for me. Lord, help me not to be grumpy. Help me to have joy in all of the amazing things that you do for other people. To celebrate with them. And to see the good in my own life. Help me not to be so introspective that I can't even see and enjoy things that you give me even when those things have been taken away again. Thank you for the good things that I've known. And Lord, help me to connect with your compassion. With your great mercy and with your love. Lord, thank you for your love for me. And thank you that I have this second chance. Simply to the cross I cling, letting go of all earthly things. I'm clinging to the cross. Lord, no righteousness of my own enables me to be there in your presence. Nothing I can do can put it right, can atone for the, for the sin that I've committed. But your blood shed for me as I read in your word and as your Holy Spirit affirms in my heart, assures me that I am forgiven and I can know the love of my Heavenly Father. I can know that I am a son of God. I am a child of God, dearly loved by you. Help me to join the party. In Jesus' name. Amen.